Alex here with a high conflict child custody video on non parent custody. I'm going to title it that because I'm going to really lump in a bunch of my previous videos here. And I also have found out that certain terms like grandparents' rights or grandparents' visitation are misleading because the rights that they appear to stem from are not actually narrowly tailored to grandparents. They apply to pretty much anyone that's not a parent. And so this is a video that will hopefully clear up some of the common questions that I get. Usually what I get are stories. And I guess I'll talk a little bit about those stories towards the end of the video. But for the beginning of the video, I'm going to go through some of these concepts. And I'm also, of course, going to replace some of the prior videos. Uh, that's going to be five videos specifically. The first one is called Third Party Custody. The second one is called Grandparents' Rights. The third one is called uh, The Parental Preference Presumption. The fourth one is called non-parties, more like I'm shoehorning that one into here than anything, but it's still, I guess, a good opportunity to talk about non-parties. Um, and then guardianship. Those five videos are being replaced with this video. So I guess I'm going to go ahead and start with the concept of parents patre. I think that's how it's pronounced. It's a Latin term. Um, again, guys, with these videos, I'm trying to get people to understand sort of general concepts as to how these things work. You can always have to actually look at your specific states, statutes, rules, and case law. And there's also tons of lawyer channels on YouTube now that talk about the particulars. I'm just trying to get people to understand sort of from the perspective of not an attorney, not being an attorney, how some of this stuff works, why it's there. And I think that it's probably a good idea to start from parents patre so that i can kind of like build a foundation as to where this whole idea comes from and i guess again guys i'm going to be as general as possible i hope that's not frustrating um this concept is the enshrinement of this notion that the government has the right to step in and take care of those who cannot take care of themselves and that includes children. And I suppose this is where this idea came, or at least what sparked the idea, that sometimes the parents of a child are not the best to take care of that child, and so the government has to step in and take custody and control of that child and give that child to a non-parent. The from what I understand, the notion is rooted in common law, and the Constitution does have a say here. The Constitution, um, as far as I know, is where the parental preference presumption comes from. It's the, I guess, sort of wall or obstacle that comes into play when a non-parent is going to step in and take custody and control of a child. And you, got, you guys, like I said earlier, you have to do your own research when it comes to these concepts. I'm just kind of giving you some overarching nutshell understanding of all of this. Is, uh, yeah, the parental preference presumption, as far as I know, creates this standard uh, that you have to show by clear and convincing evidence that the actual parents of the child are unfit. And that's like the beginning sort of process of the analysis of deciding what to do with the child going forward. Um, so there's the parental preference presumption, which is that a parent of a child is presumed fit. Um, and as long as they're fit, you can't give custody to somebody else. And that's that big hurdle that comes from the Constitution. Um, and that is also actually enshrined in some statutory law as well. I've seen it in Nevada law where they codify that principle, that you have to show that the parent is a danger to the child, and I believe it's by clear and convincing evidence, I'm not sure, but I believe it is, and that for the child to go into anybody else's custody and control, that's the first thing that has to be shown. So, again guys, parents, patria, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, that's the Latin term that's rooted in common law, which is sort of where the government can step in and take care of one of its subjects that aren't able to take care of themselves. And then the Constitution adds a little bit onto that, which is parental preference. So 
Now we get into some of the different ways that this can happen. And I guess I'll start with custody by a non-parent. I mentioned earlier in the video that grandparents' rights, that that's just like a colloquial term that ordinary people came up with. I haven't seen that anywhere formally recognized, at least not in Nevada law. They just have non-parent custody and non-parent visitation. And that includes grandparents, but it can also be aunts and uncles and complete strangers, step parents. I mean, I guess the sky's the limit on that. There are principles that I've seen in the statutes that control each of those things in different ways. Um, and that's going to be really up to you guys to do your research on when it comes to custody, that whole parental preference presumption is going to kick in. Um, and when it comes to visitation, from what I have seen, in, in, in a different way, they sort of allude to that. So the first thing that, that it appears you have to show to get visitation is you have to show that you've already had some kind of relationship with the child. Um, one thing that jumps into mind is grandparents because most of the time grandparents have some time that they spend with the child they have built some kind of relationship and then the other way is a step parent i have seen um situations where the regular parent okay so they've married one of the parents and the other parent is just not involved for whatever reason and the step parent or even if they are involved you know maybe they are involved but the step parents been there for five or ten years and they've built a relationship with the child um if those two things are shown that a non-parent can get visitation, but they still have an obstacle there as well. And the obstacle that I have seen is that the law creates a presumption against letting them have visitation if both of the parents won't let well, you know won't let this person have visitation. So it still seems almost as hard as overcoming as the parental preference presumption anyway. I mean, you don't have to show that the parents are dangerous. But you still have to overcome a presumption so you're not going to court on equal footing you're just not and, and that's probably the way it should be to be honest so um, maybe not as hard as the parental preference presumption but there's still a presumption against you getting visitation that's still there and so that particular person um, has to show they have to overcome a presumption which means they're gonna have to show some kind of evidence that it's in the best interest of the child for them a non-parent to get visitation of the child so from both directions, really, it's very difficult. And I think that's ref that's a reflection of probably what society expects. So that's a good thing. Um, joint custody with a non-parent. I don't think this is a thing. I don't think this exists. I don't think it makes any sense. I mean, if a non-parent is, is getting custody, then they're showing that the parents are dangerous to the child. So the concept of joint physical and joint legal custody just doesn't make any sense because right from the get-go, they've proven that those parents are dangerous. Um, if there is anybody out there that has seen anything like that, let me know. Put it down in the comments below. But, you know, custody between mom and dad is very different. There is no parental preference presumption because they're both parents. And they don't have to show parental unfitness either because both of them are parents. And so really it comes down to the state or the government stepping in as a mediator to decide, you know, these are two parents, they're both good parents. What are we gonna do with regards to custody and visitation? And so I, it makes more sense that there is a joint physical custody concept there because there isn't necessarily uh, just automatically gonna be a situation where the parents are dangerous. Of course, there are ways to do that in a regular custody case too, but though there are other videos that go into that. Um, Guardianship. I don't want to talk a lot about guardianship because really it's barely, as far as I can see, any different than just a non-parent getting custody of a child. I suppose, like right from the get-go, guardianship is implied to be temporary, that there's some sort of expectation that eventually the parents are going to come back into the picture. Um, I do know that there are other requirements involved in guardianships, like there's accountings, yearly accountings, and there could be a uh, guardian ad litem involved, there could be a uh, child's attorney involved, um, there could be more of an expectation that the child is going to get to, you know, have a say. But from what I've seen, all of the same 
principles get in the way of a guardianship that get in the way of a, uh, a third party getting custody which is the parental preference presumption the constitution the burden of proof all that stuff is there so uh, great just you know thing for people to know and be aware of but like with everything else in this video to find out all the particulars and the technical details you just have to do your own research or hire an attorney um i guess i guess i get this question a lot which is I mean, are there any limits to who can do it? And really, what I talked about earlier is, no. I mean, it's just considered by the government to be custody by a non-parent or visitation by a non-parent. And as long as the person complies with the requirements, they can do that. Um, that could include an unmarried boyfriend or girlfriend. It really can. Uh, you know, just want to not scare people and just bring up that, for the most part, judges are super hesitant to do this. Just from all different angles, they are. And so the fact that somebody can try and do this, I think, is alarming to a lot of people. But from what I have seen, it is something that doesn't work very often. I've seen a lot of appeals come down from the Supreme Court in Nevada affirming decisions, not letting, you know, a third party have custody or visitation. It's, pretty, it's a pretty common thing that the judges do is they deny these petitions, and it seems like the Supreme Court upholds it. I've seen some situations where the Supreme Court will overturn a decision because a judge will not even hear the case. They'll say that it's just impossible, and they won't even hear the case. And so the Supreme Court will overturn it and send it back and say, yeah, it is possible, even if it's unlikely, it is possible for them to do this. So you at least have to hear them out. But for, for the most part, I don't want people to be, like, panicking over this. Just because a non-party can try and do this doesn't mean that they're going to succeed. In fact, quite to the contrary, I don't see it succeed. <clears throat> Very often, adoption, you know, I don't... I know that I'm not going to do a replacement video for adoption. Um, I'm going to leave that video up, um, but I will mention that this is something that non-parties can do, or sorry, non-parents can do. A non-parent can adopt a child, and that's something that's quite ordinary uh, for people to get their head around. That's just something that, that, that people understand that. Uh, if you want to learn more about adoption, uh, you're going to have to watch the video adoption that, that goes into all those details. So. I did talk in the beginning about stories, and the stories are always sad. They're emailed to me, I feel terrible when I read them, and I, I'll talk about two stories, and, and it's not a specific story, I'm just kind of lumping all the stories together. One of the most common stories is that a step, a step parent was raising you know, their married partner's kids for, let's just say 10 years, and then they leave them, they, you know, they file for divorce, and <clears throat> they feel bad and they miss the kids because they feel like they were theirs. There's one story in particular. They were raising the kids from age two and the mom was not involved. They were with the kids in, uh, for 10 years. So the, ages two to 14, I guess, something like that. And they're upset now because they expect some kind of custody or visitation of those kids, even though they're not their kids. Yeah, you can file. Um, you could try. I imagine it wouldn't even be in the same case. I imagine that it would be completely separate from their divorce because those are not, you know, that's not their child. So imagine they'd have their divorce action going and then they'd have a completely separate child custody action going. And the targets of that lawsuit would be their ex and the biological parent, even though they're not involved. They're going to have to be sued. Um... And all of those, you know, mechanisms trigger. The parental preference uh, presumption will trigger if they're trying to get custody. If they're just asking for visitation, then it's a little bit easier, but it's only a little bit. And they still have to file that action as a petition, and they still have to target the biological parent, even though they weren't involved. I almost feel like um, it's an injustice to them and wrong for the biological parent to have not done something by that point. If you're, if you're a biological parent, and you've been married to this other person and the other parent, the bio parent, the bio mom or bio dad, you know, is not involved and the person you've married has been raising those kids from age two to 12, that is messed up. Like, they're get, that's a long, long time to raise your kids and there's just no way they're not gonna get attached to those kids after that long, especially from such a young age. At some point, if the other person hasn't been involved for that insanely long of time, like, I mean, one or two years, three years, okay, fine, but like 
five, six, seven, eight, ten years. That's a long time. And it's like, I feel like a parent has a responsibility at that, at that point to terminate the other person's parental rights and adopt. I mean, it's just like, the messed up is the only way I can describe that. It's one thing if the other parent is involved, if they're getting visitation and they're paying child support and they're the part of the kids lives and obviously just leave it alone but to for the, the other parent to have just completely checked out and the step parent to have taken over for that long of time you know at some point there's a responsibility to do the tpr and adoption there just is and it's not even about the step parent as much as it's a you know it's for the kids so i, I guess some people might be like well alex hold on a second I always want to have the option that if I divorce that I can just cut the other person off and not pay them child support. Okay, I mean, that is true. Strategy, decision. Strategically, it's better for you, but is it better for the kids? I don't know about that. Uh, then there's another sort of cluster of stories that I get. I, I don't get these quite as often, but I still get these stories where somebody will go to court for custody of their child with, I guess, a parent from like a, a same-sex marriage or something like that. Um, these do, I do get these. And I guess, I really don't know all of the laws surrounding how this works. I guess there are ways to do this legally. Um, and then there's other ways to do it you sort of out of court or off the books or, or, or I guess just privately. And I've heard stories where they will, you know, split up somebody will file a petition to establish custody and then the biological parent loses and after they lose they freak out and they track down the the sperm donor and then they, they track the person down and they get them to come into court or they use them somehow as a way to try and fix having lost custody this does happen um i i wish i knew more about how a sperm this the whole like sperm donor slash intra uh, what do they call it um there's a there's a there's other ways to do this ifv i think that's what they call it in vitro fertilization i guess there's ways to do this and that if you comply with the laws you don't have to worry about this problem as much but if you don't then it can get really quirky and i've heard stories of people who don't do that they don't comply with the law they just wing it and then when they end up in in court in family court they end up getting custody and then they, um, they, for whatever reason, the other person who's the bio parent who lost, they kind of see this as a way to try and fix having lost. They go and track down the, the biological parent and somehow rope them into the court case. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is, I guess I'll talk about a third story. And this is um, a, a situation where the rules were followed. Um, this is a situation where there is a, a, a father and a mother, and so they split up, <clears throat> and the mother terminated the father's parental rights, and she adopted her child to the stepfather. This, so uh, basically, this is the other side of the coin, where the rules were followed. There was a TPR, there was an adoption, and then they ended up divorcing. Um, well, that father, who was just a step-parent but became a father through the legal adoption, um, he ended up getting custody of the kids because the court, for whatever reason, I don't know what the findings were, but they found that it was in the best interest of the child to put those children with the father who adopted them, not with the biological mother. So, I mean, that's the other side of the coin where somebody, you know, they followed the rules, he complied with the rules, and they went to court on equal fitting, and the kids were put with the parent who was in the court's eyes better. Uh, so, yeah, complying with the law and following the law you know, can protect a person from this sort of situation. I imagine if that father did not adopt those children, he probably would have ended up with nothing. The mother would have probably just walked away and there's, there's probably not much he could have done. I know in the beginning of the video, I described examples of what you could try and do. But like I said, you don't come to court with equal footing. You just don't. And there's just so many hurdles in your way that just because you can try and do that doesn't mean you'll succeed. It's much harder. I imagine that it was much easier for this father to get the outcome that he got because he had adopted the child. Um, CPS, people are curious about 
CPS doing this? Yes, CPS can adopt children. They can terminate parental rights. They can impose guardianships. But just because they can do this doesn't mean they're the only ones who can. I think that's where people get you know hung up on this. I think a lot of people say, well, hold on. This is something that CPS does. Yeah, it's true. They usually are the ones to do this. And that's usually where it comes from. But they don't. it doesn't have to be that way. They don't have to be involved at all. They, people can just go and try and do these things, file these types of cases without CPS. Um, I guess that bothers people a little bit, but I mean, it's what it, you know, what, what it comes down to is there's protections in place. The protections are going to apply whether it's CPS or not. And, um, a lot of times people don't really approve of CPS anyway. They don't think that they know what they're doing. I mean, I guess it's nice because it's the free way to do it. Because as far as I know, when CPS is doing this stuff, it's free. The parents who are the, who they're going to give an adoption to or or guardianship of um, my understanding is that they don't have to do anything they don't have to pay any money they don't have to litigate and so I mean that's true that they, they can do it for free but there's all kinds of other caveats involved when CPS is is part of the you know process and um, I'm not going to talk about that in this video because I have other videos that talk about that so if you want to learn more about that watch the video abuse and neglect proceedings and then there's another video titled abuse and neglect proceedings revisited um, the last thing I was going to talk about is reality when it comes to enforcement. I don't get a lot of happy stories when it comes to enforcement of non-party custody and non-party visitation. I've heard a lot of stories where the parent just violates the court's orders. And then the non... I keep saying non-party. I meant to say non-parent. And then the non-parent goes back to court. Maybe they're not getting the visitation they're supposed to. Maybe the other parent ran off with the kids. They come back to court and they try to get the court to step in and the court is just really reluctant to take that additional step and hold them in contempt of court, jail them, fine them, stuff like that. So uh, I hate to say that that's what, you know, is going on, but it is. Um, and yeah, if you are one of those non-parents that are getting custody or visitation of a child, you could end up having to be that person who's going back to court over and over and over and over and over again, filing motions for order to show cause. Um, so I did say I was going to shoehorn the topic of non-parties into this video. At this time, I said non-parties on purpose because I meant to say it. <sighs> Involving non-parties in any of these types of cases, including an ordinary child custody case, is usually a very bad idea. And it's usually a waste of time. And it can backfire. What I mean by that, and I guess we're going to ordinary sort of child custody situations here, is a lot of times parents will have such a strong desire to avoid going back to court. They don't want to file something. They don't want to pay the money. They don't want to go through the stress. They don't want to try to contempt their ex. So what they'll do is they'll try and put all of the burdens of the conflict on to the teachers or the doctors, the principal. Their ex won't be doing something that they should be doing. So they'll say, I know what, I can just call the teacher. I can just call the principal. I can just tell the doctor. And they end up roping these other people into the case and all it does is make you look like the weird family who can't get along. Um, it, it, it's embarrassing to the family and the child and it can backfire. The other parent can go and back into court and say, hey, they're the high conflict one because they're the ones that are trying to involve, you know, the teacher and all these other people into our custody dispute. If the other parent is not doing something that they're supposed to be doing, the proper recourse is to have them held in contempt or to somehow modify custody. Trying to force these other people to, to pick up the slack is just going to make them resentful of the family. They're going to blackball the family as a problem family. They might not comply, and then what's the court going to do? I mean, they're not even a party to the case. So what, is the court going to contempt the principal or the teacher? They can't do that. Um, so my strong recommendation is to not rope in all of these other people to the child custody dispute. They're not, like, there's nothing the court can do about it anyway. If there is something that a court can do to a non-party, please post that down in the comments below because that is news to me. Uh, I guess the last thing I'm going to mention here is... I think that this bothers a lot of people because they don't like the idea of non-parents getting, you know, custody of kids. All I want to say is that according to the United States, children are not slaves, they're not property, they're living creatures. 
And so the Constitution is there. It's created a presumption. It's created some hurdles. Um, I mean, the, the principle of the, ch the parent is least likely to be abused by the parents and the principle that the, the child is most likely to be loved and raised best by the parents, it's there. It's enshrined in the Constitution. It doesn't mean that it's impossible <clears throat> for a non-parent to get custody of kids. It doesn't mean that parents can do whatever they want to their kids and nobody can do anything about it. It just means what I said it means, which is, according to the Constitution, the best parent is usually the biological parents, but that usually does not mean always, and usually does, does not mean that those kids are slaves or property. So yes, this is something that can happen, but it doesn't usually happen. There's, there's doorways that can be opened to make it happen, but it's not something that is preferred by the government. I hope that this video makes a lot of sense to my viewers. If you have any questions, feel free to post those questions down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.